Hey everyone, welcome to Every Nation Sunny Hill. My name is Shri Dean and I will be your host for today's church service. It's super great to have you joining us here. I hope that you feel encouraged and strengthened through the service. If you're joining for the first time, I'd like to especially welcome you. I'd also like to encourage you to fill out a connection card. Filling out a connection card just gives us the opportunity to chat with you and find out how you found the service. We'd really love to hear from you. You can find the link for the connection card under the comment section, or you can access the connection card by scanning the QR code. What really drives us and motivates us to do what we do as a church is our vision to see lives, communities, and societies transformed through discipleship in the word, the power, and the presence of God. God's desire is that we will all find freedom. It's now time to get into worship. I hope you enjoy as you just praise the Lord. Welcome to everyone who's coming in from home, from the comfort of your homes. Welcome to our session. Holy Spirit, we welcome you importantly, crucially. Thank you, Father, that you remain good always. Your name is faithfulness. Your name is goodness. Your name is beauty. Your name is kindness. That's your character. And we just rest in that assurance, Lord. We bless you, Holy Spirit, at this time, as always. Yes. You are good. And your love endures forever. You are good. And your love endures forever. You are good. And your love endures forever. You are good. You are good. You are good. Lord, and your love endures forever. You are good, and your love endures forever. You are good, and your love endures forever. You are good, yes, you are good. My God, you are the only one. You are the one that I desire. You are the only one, my King. You are the only one. You are the one that I desire. You are the only one, my King. Because you are good and your love endures forever. That's who you are, you are good and your love endures forever. You are good and your love endures forever. You are good, yes, you are good. You are good, you are good, that's who you are, Lord, you are good all the time, and you are good. Oh, we thank you for your love, Lord. Oh, we bless you, Lord God. Your faithfulness is for all ages, oh, Father. Rufuno reamangas, Lord. Great are your mercies, Lord. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Each morning, your mercies are new to us, Lord God. And we thank you that we rest secure in that love which just doesn't end. Thank you, Lord. Oh, 
comes in your name, Lord. Greet us like that ever faithful morning dew upon the fount. Like the sun that rises every morning, so is your great love and your mercy to us, O oh God. It never ends. Thank you, Lord. You are seated on the throne. You are lifted high above forever. And ever you are seated on the throne, you will lift it high above forever and ever. You are seated on the throne, you will lift it high above forever. Believe that I have a 
on the throne you will leave dead high above forever and ever you are seated on the throne you will leave dead high above forever I'm back again for the announcements. We have one super exciting event that's happening from the 21st to the 31st of July. We're having our outreach internship. The outreach internship is training for people to learn how to share the gospel with others. So whether you feel like you have a calling on your life to be an evangelist, or you would just like to learn how to share the gospel with your friends, with your family, or even with your colleagues, this is really a great opportunity. God in the past has used people that attend this event to bring many souls to Him and to transform their lives. It's not about us, but about what God wants to do through us. And I'd just like to leave you with this verse. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The total cost for this event, if you are residing in Johannesburg and won't need accommodation and food, will be 3100 but if you are traveling in from another province, the total cost of attending this event will be 7,600. Those are all the announcements. I hope you guys enjoy um, the word as Pastor Chemba takes us through it. Hi, my name is Temba, and it's a great joy to share God's Word with you this morning. We're starting a brand new series called Lead Where You Are. Let's go before God in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your presence that is with us. And even now, in our different locations, in our different places, at different times, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and open up your Word. Help us to understand and see what you're showing us today. And we ask, Lord, that let it be unto us according to your word, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. It's interesting that the topic of leadership is most probably one of the greatly misunderstood topics that we have in the world today. For some people, when they hear the word lead, different images come up in their mind. Maybe it's a, a politician that comes to mind. Maybe it's one of their favorite politicians, or maybe it is um, a politician that they don't like. And even in that small snapshot, we can see that they're good leaders and bad leaders. Leaders who do good in society and leaders who do bad in society. We don't have to take a long walk down memory lane to think of leaders who fall into either of those categories. When you hear the word leader, I wonder what you hear. Is leadership something that you desire to do? Is it something you aspire to do? Or is it something that you see as being a mystery? I wonder how someone can become a leader. I wonder how people get to do what they do. Maybe leadership for you is something that you see as missing. 
It's often been said that the greatest poverty in Africa is not a poverty of resources, but rather a poverty of leadership. As I quote Dr. Elijah Maswangani. And as we reflect on leadership, maybe leadership is something you've seen misused and missing, but I believe that leadership is a great power for change in every situation. And I believe leadership is something that we are all called to do. And this morning as we go into God's Word and unpack the concept of leadership, I'd really like you to reflect on the true nature of what leadership is. It's often been described by authors like Dr. John C. Maxwell that leadership is defined as influence, the ability to influence others. Now, when I reflect on leadership and our current state in the world today, there's a cry for change. There's a cry to say, I wish things could get better, whether it's the economy, whether it's the family, whether it's the medical care, COVID-19. There's a cry in the world today for change for the better. There's a cry in the world today for influence that makes things better. And I believe the heart of that cry is a cry for leadership. There's a cry for leadership in the world today. So let's run with that definition of leadership being influenced. I like that definition. And if you were to ask me to expound on how I would define leadership, I'd say we'd need to look at this issue of influence a little bit more. So if leadership is influence, then I can define leadership this way. Leadership is the ability to influence people, relationships, resources for the common good and the glory of God. Often when we talk about leadership, it's just making a temporal impact or maybe making people's lives better. But ultimately, I believe the kind of influence we're called to have as believers is one where God is ultimately glorified in whatever we do. So, it begs the question, doesn't it? That if leadership is influence and we want to study leadership and understand leadership, we've got to figure out who has had the greatest influence in the world. Who has had the greatest influence on society? You can look at great inventors. You can look at great leaders like Steve Jobs. You can even look at different people who have made their mark. You can look at the President Lincolns. You can look at the President Mandela's. You can look at the unsung heroes like Mother Teresa, etc. And they've had a huge impact on the world. But I would argue that spanning over a period of over 2,000 years of world history, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who's had a greater positive impact on the world than Jesus Christ. When you look at what Jesus Christ's influences meant, not just for believers and Christians, but how his words have shaped what these believers and Christians went out and did and how ultimately it impacted the world, the results are truly staggering. So I believe if we want to understand the power of leadership influence and harness that power in our world today, we should look at Jesus Christ. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus describes the kind of leadership that changes the world. The kind of leadership that exerts influence in society that changes everything. Are you there? Matthew chapter 20. And we'll pick it up in verse 20. And this is our core text for this morning. And we'll apply it for the rest of our time together. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus and with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, 
Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and the left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Now, when the other disciples, the ten, heard what was going on, they were indignant at the two brothers. <laughs> but Jesus, after he saw what was going on, he calls them all together. And he says this to him, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What Jesus introduces here is a total paradigm shift of how leadership should happen. A summary of the story, he's got 12 disciples, two of them set their mum up and say, Mum, ask Jesus if we can be like the hotshots around here. The mum goes to Jesus and says, mm -mm -mm. Jesus, can my two boys, you know, can they have a place of prominence in your kingdom? One at the right and the other one at the left. And Jesus says, well, that's not for my father to give it. Now, when the other 10 disciples, Jesus had 10 core disciples that he ministered into while he was here on earth. And when the other 10 heard it, they were indignant. Question. Why do you think they were indignant? Because they wanted to sit at the left or the right hand of the Father. They wanted to be the main kahunas. Now, when you look at the rest of the discourse, Jesus calls them to himself, all 12. And he says, we need a paradigm shift in what leadership looks like. It says, when you look at the worldly system, people exercise authority and they rule and lord over people. And he says, this shall not be so with you. It's interesting when you look at different characters in the world around us, there are people who have been great leaders, but not servant leaders. Steve Jobs, for example, was famed for being in an elevator and looking across at someone who was in the elevator. And based on the responses to the questions he'd asked them, he'd fire them on the spot. He was renowned for, renowned for going around the organization and lording it over people, making sure people knew that he was in charge. He was the boss. Now, it's a true saying that if you have to tell people you're the boss, then you really aren't. <laughs> so, his view of leadership was to lord it over people, to push them around, to show that well, he was in charge, to order them to go and do things and to come. And unfortunately today, that's the picture many of us have of leadership. And often it starts young, doesn't it, that picture? It starts off when we're in school, in high school. And it's like, okay, it's time to choose the prefects, or it's time to choose the student council. And the people who are chosen for student council are typically the ones who are the most popular, the most intelligent, the most sporty, and those are the ones who end up in leadership. 
And so we start to believe and develop a mentality that leaders are the most popular people, the most skilled people, the people that everyone gravitates towards. And often in school systems, the prefects are the ones who get to tell people what they can do. So our picture of leadership is all about telling people what to do. In organizations, the boss is the one who gets to tell people what to do, who gets to hire and fire. And yes, that is a central part of leadership. You can't take that out of leadership. Someone needs to call the shots. Someone needs to create vision and plans and strategy and make sure that there's order in the organization. But Jesus was talking about something more fundamental to our approach to leadership. I remember in my leadership lessons, we were taught that there is a difference between the carrot and the stick. The carrot and the stick. Two ways of leading people, right? One is the carrot by positive affirmation, uh, looking at things through the lens of what could be rewards. And the other way is the stick, driving people and forcing them to do things. And the reality is a lot of leadership looks more like the stick than the carrot. Now, some people get creative and they say, let's combine the two and let's get a carrot shaped stick. <laughs> a carrot shaped stick and then we'll make people think it's encouraging, but really what we're doing is driving and beating them. So that's the worldly model of leadership, lording it over people, being the boss, pushing people around. But Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. And then Jesus here turns the script, and this is what he says. But whoever among you would be great must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the greatest must learn to serve. What a paradigm shift. What a paradigm shift. In our world today, we're told, if you want to be great, you've got to be a go-getter. You've got to step over people. There are even books about ascending the corporate culture. One is called, the title of the book is called, <laughs> Eat or Be Eaten. <laughs> and that creates a mentality of how leadership works. That I either, I either need to... to Step on other people, or I will be stepped on. Eat, or you will be eaten. <laughs> what a negative paradigm of leadership. But Jesus introduces something else here. He says, true leadership is like being a servant. Now, the word servant is a Greek word, diakonos. And the word diakonos means a doer of menial tasks. So it says, whoever wants to be the greatest must be willing to do the insignificant things, the, the, the menial tasks around us. Now, a great story is told about how servant leadership is the heart of every organization. Robert Greenleaf um, popularized this idea of how servant leadership impacts an organization. He was reading a book by Hermaine Hesse called The Journey to the East. And it's a story, a mythical story of a band of men on a journey to the East. And... As this band of men are about to embark on their journey, they, they employ the help of a servant called Leo. And as the book progresses, Leo really is the central character of the story. So Leo accompanies this party as their servant. And he does all the menial chores on their journey. He's a person of extraordinary presence in the group. And he sustains their spirit with laughter and joy. 
But as the journey goes on, Leo disappears. And everything in this group starts to fall apart. They start arguing, tasks aren't getting done. And before long, the entire party has disbanded and failed to continue their journey to reach the east. So, a few years later, one of the party goes looking for Leo to try and find out what happened. And when he finds Leo, he finds out that Leo was in fact the head of an order and in fact a great leader himself. And through this allegory, there's a potent truth. Servant leadership makes the difference in every organization. It's when that person was no longer there, when Leo was no longer there, that they realized how indispensable the servant attitude is to what they were doing. No organization, no family, no church, no place can survive without the servant attitude. Those who are willing to do the menial things so that everything can get done. So this is the kind of attitude that Jesus espoused right here in the Word of God. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. So he goes from servant to slave. Servant, diakonos, slave, doulos. The word doulos in the Greek means someone who's given up their rights in order to serve and they serve not out of a sense of responsibility, but out of a sense of love. They're a love slave. That's what a doulos was. Someone who was a servant, a slave, out of love for their master. They gave up their rights. And what Jesus is talking about here in this model of leadership, of servant leadership, is that in order to be a leader that makes a difference in people's lives, makes a difference in the world, you must be willing to give up your rights. As you grow as a servant leadership, as a servant leader, you need to be willing to give up your rights and increase the level of responsibility that you take on in the world. What would happen if we had more leaders like this? And I want you to know what, God, what Jesus says. And yes, Jesus is God. And he says this, And whoever would be the first among you would be a slave. Verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Now this is our memory verse for this week. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for me. Now Jesus was God, and he says this, I did not come to be served, but rather to serve and to lay down my life as a ransom for many. That is the servant leadership paradigm. If we want to see great servant leaders in our world today, we have got to get servant leadership down into our hearts. Jesus himself said, I came as God onto planet Earth, not to be served by everybody, but to serve. The first thing a servant leadership, a servant leader does in any environment, be it the home, be it the workplace, be it among your friends, your family members, be it in church. The first hallmark of a servant leader is not, I have come here to see how others can serve me. No, I've not come to be served. I have not come to be served. That is the, the most important hallmark of a servant leader. The second is that, but I have come to serve. I've done whatever it takes to help these people get to where God wants them to go. And finally, to give up our life, to give up our rights as a ransom for the benefit of many. 
It was Noah Webster, the writer of the Webster's Bible, not Webster's Bible, Webster's Dictionary, who wrote this and said, The virtues of men are of more consequence to society than their abilities. And for this reason, the heart should be cultivated with more assiduity than the head. So what Noah Webster is saying that the the way that our heart is shaped will determine what we do. So we need to be more careful about what we think than about what we do. Because ultimately what we do will flow out of what we think. What is the shape of our hearts when it comes to leadership? I want to show through some examples that you might be aware of. Some examples of servant leadership. These are great transformation stories. We all like great transformation stories, right? Going from being a, uh, in chess, from being a pawn to becoming a queen. Oh, that's a great transformation, right? You know you've played the game well. What about in nature when you see this horrible caterpillar eventually turn into a chrysalis and then a butterfly? Oh, that's a beautiful transformation story. But what about... The transformation by a beautiful kiss that if you just give a frog a kiss it'll turn into a prince now I must just say for the ladies out there that is a fairy tale story amen don't go around kissing frogs metaphorically or literal Amen. All right, back to my story. So, leadership creates transformations. And in every single one of these leadership stories, I want you to see how these servant leadership principles led to transformations. It was Robert Greenleaf, the modern um, founder who popularized in business the ideas of servant leadership, who said good leaders must first become good servants. So let's look at some leadership transformation stories and see glimpses of how the servant principles Jesus taught, when applied, make a difference. Now, no, not all these characters are Christians. But they've taken biblical principles, applied them in the workplace, and you'll see a great difference. The first one I want to highlight is President Zelensky of Ukraine. Now, President Zelensky started off as an actor and a comedian. In fact, he was well known in Ukraine for playing the role of a school teacher who became president. And a strange scenario of life imitating art, he runs for presidency and is actually elected. And many people didn't take him very seriously. And you know, he could have ascended to the role of president and said, well, now I've made it. Now it's all about me. But as the war of Russia, uh, the war against Russia started, you saw a great transformation. Zelensky could have run away, but you see this actor turned president, lay down his life for his country. And because he lays down his life for his country, it inspires courage in his fellow countrymen. Because they understand that he's just an actor, a normal person, just like you and me. And if he can lay down his life for the sake of the country, so can I. And as Zelensky has exhibited the servant leadership trait of laying down your life for the sake of others, the nation has followed. There's something about servant leadership that is so inspirational. When we see someone living for a cause, giving up everything for the sake of a cause, it is so inspirational and people want to follow that. We see that in the life of Jesus and we see a modern day example in President Zelensky. There's that famous um, tweet where the Americans at the beginning of the war said, we can evacuate you out of Ukraine. And Zelensky said, 
Don't send evacuation, rather send ammunition. He was willing to fight for what he believed in. There's a modern day example that servant leadership works. When you go to the workplace, one of the greatest examples today is Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. Satya has been voted for six years in the row, the most underrated CEO in the world. <laughs> because he comes across so humble, but achieves so much. And one of the things that Satya Nadella is well known for doing at Microsoft is for changing the culture. This is what he did. He rejected the know-it-all mentality of the leaders at Microsoft. Does that sound familiar? Yes. It's like when Jesus said that the leader doesn't come to be served because he knows everything. Jim Collins, a leadership guru, said that the worst kind of leaders are the ones where the organization looks like the genius with many helpers. The genius with many helpers. There's a kind of organization where the leader knows it all. Some people want churches to be like that. The pastor knows it all. The pastor can do it all. The pastor is the greatest of this. The pastor is the greatest of that. Pastor, that. that pastor, there's a pastor that. And guys, that is a setup for disaster because everybody's limited. In fact, so beautiful is the image of what church should be because the Bible says it's like a body with many different parts that fit together and each part must do its part. Yes, the pastor must pastor, but yes, his main role of pastoring is to equip the saints so that they can be the ones to minister. The church is about everyone. And at Microsoft, you see this in action where Nadella started to listen to the people at Microsoft. And this led to a powerful environment, cultural change, where ideas were unlocked from the organization, and the organization was reinvigorated. Nadella's approach to leadership was not that I've come to be served, but I've come to serve. Great servant leaders listen to the people around them. In the family environment, they listen to their wives, to their children. In the work environment, they listen to their colleagues, to their subordinates. They listen. Great servant leaders don't come to be served, but they come to be served by others. The next figure is a bit of a controversial one. John Magafuli, the late president of Tanzania, was a great servant leader. Unfortunately, he was also a COVID-19 denialist. And again, none of these examples are of perfect individuals or even godly individuals. But President Magafuli was great in that when he took office, he inspired a new wave of servant leadership in his government. It's interesting that the word minister means to serve. And the prime minister is the word for the prime servants of the people. And leadership is all about serving the people. He would organize days where he as the president would walk the street with the other leaders and minister and cabinet members and people in the community and pick up paper in the community. He led by example. He was not afraid to do the menial tasks to be an example for people. And as he did that, the culture of Tanzania started to transform. And his few short years of leading that country resulted in a radical change in that nation. At the end of his presidency, we know it didn't end well because of his denialism around COVID. But he got a lot of things right when he was living in the servant paradigm, living for the good of his people. So you can see servant leadership really does change environments. Finally, let me talk about the home. In the home, a home is transformed when people stop trying to receive and get things from each other and they start serving each other. 
What would happen in the home if the father came home and said, Honey, I'm home. And instead of asking what's for dinner, he says, I'm ready to cook dinner. <laughs> what would happen? Now, some of you would say, I've just created World War III. Maybe it's a paradigm shift. Because when we get into the role of serving each other, it changes the environment in the home. What if the parents are there not to be served by their kids, but to serve their kids? What if the parents are there to make an impact in the lives of the next generation? What if the kids don't see themselves as the recipient of all the love and all the care, but actually develop servant characteristics within the home? The home can't but change. The home can't but change. There's real power in servant leadership. Jesus said in verse 28, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As I close, I want to reflect on one last thing. The greatest example of servant leadership is when we lay down our lives for a vision that's greater than ours, for people, for the lives of many. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave us the ultimate symbol and picture of servant leadership. That he was willing to give up his life so that others might live. You know, in this world, to give up our lives so that others can benefit is commendable. But Jesus didn't just give up his life so that we could have life. But he gave up his life so that we could have a relationship with God. So that we could experience a life lived with God. Because every life is better when God is at the center of it. Every life. And I believe none of us should spend one second longer without having God in the middle of our lives. And Jesus knew that if he didn't die on the cross in our place, we would end up closed off from being able to have a relationship with God. Closed off from being able to experience a life lived with God and ultimately shut out of heaven and headed for life with God, without God, headed for hell. You know, what Jesus did, he paid the ultimate price so we could live. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. But I want to give you an invitation today to put your trust in what Jesus did. You know, the wonder of the Bible is that, yes, it talks about servant leadership, and we could try and implement servant leadership, and it's good, and you can see the power of it, from Zelensky to Nadella to all these leaders. You can see the power of servant leadership, but here's the deal. Even more powerful is how God transforms our hearts that enables us to live differently. And when you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to relationship with God. You're, seeing, you're saying yes to being transformed, being made a new creation from this day forward. That is the power of Jesus in our lives. So I want to invite you to pray with me. And you'll see there's some details on the screen and also some details in the chat line uh, below, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you're watching this. Uh, there'll be a link to a connection card. After this prayer, I want you to fill out that connection card so that we can help you to grow in your relationship with God. But let's start it off by inviting God into your life. Maybe you used to be a Christian or you, you want to come back to the love of the Father. You can pray this prayer as well. Let's pray. Father God, you can repeat after me. Father God, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I've tried to do life by myself. It's not working. I want you, God, in the middle of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, 
Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross in my place to take away my sins and give me a relationship with God the Father. Today I say yes, Father God. I want to receive that forgiveness. Today I say yes, I want a relationship with you. And today I say yes, I want to live life with you in the middle. Father God, today, change me from the inside out. Today, make me a new creation. From this day forward, I am your child. If you prayed that prayer with me, say a loud amen. Amen. This is the beginning of an exciting season in your life. I want to encourage you, fill out that connection card. Come to church on Sunday. would love to help you to grow in this relationship with God. Nothing is better than a life lived with God. Because following Jesus will change your life. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Temba, for taking us through the word. If you are joining for the first time, I'd just like to encourage you again to fill out a connection card. Filling out a connection card just gives us an opportunity to hear from you, find out how you found the service, and chat with you for a bit. You can find the link for the connection card under the comment section, or alternatively, you can access the connection card by scanning the QR code. If you'd like to pay a visit to our church, you can make your way to 26 Archer Road, Sunning Hill. Our services start at 9 a.m. and finish around 10.30. That's all from me, guys. I hope that you have a blessed and a fruitful weekend. Goodbye.